Welcome. Everybody hear me? Welcome. Did you hear that? There you go. Thanks for coming out and giving us your Friday night. Uh, this is a special presentation of Star Talk, Star Talk at BAM. And in this presentation, you're going to get three versions of what our Star Talk franchise is all about. The first one, lasting 30 minutes, is Star Talk. <laughs> Star Talk. Star, Star Talk flagship, all right, where I am the host, and we have special guests talking about special topics. We then go to another 30 minutes featuring Star Talk All Stars, and that's where we have a cadre of uh, counterparts to me who are experts in other fields of science, uh, and they each have their own sort of radio show with a comedian, similar format, but they get to do it their way. Star Talk All Stars, you'll get a sampling of that for 30 minutes. And then we will end with one of our favorite new franchises of Star Talk, Star Talk Playing with Science, which is all about the science of sports. And tonight, we're going to talk about the physics of figure skating. And we'll get back to that in a minute. But right now, we will begin Star Talk at BAM. I will bring out my comedic co host, the one, the only Chuck Nice. Come on out. Yeah. What's up, buddy? Oh, man. How are you, man? This is my man. It's good to see you. Very cool. So, tonight, we're going to talk about the physics of the early universe. Ooh. And I realized this, was, this whole event was introduced as a, a radio love fest, but, I, but, but I, he didn't say it right. You got to say a radio love fest. <laughs> <laughs> you got to yeah. do that right. Yeah, exactly. I think you just made the universe pregnant. <laughs> uh, let me introduce a colleague and a friend, one of the smartest people on Earth, theoretical physicist, Brian Green, everybody. <laughs> Brian... Uh, Green, best known for sort of popularizing concepts like string theory and the multiverse. You just made string theory pregnant, man. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, your best-selling author, The Elegant Universe, a beautiful book. Give it one. That person one, read one your cell. book right there. <laughs> that person read your book. Uh, <laughs> I know the rest of you are just posers. <laughs> So uh, that was followed with a, a Fabric of the Cosmos, yep. a beautiful book. Hidden Reality was a third book. And then you are co-founder of the World Science Festival. That's right. A uh, co-founder. It's, it's a bit audacious to call it the World Science Festival. Well, we we're going to call it the universe, but, you know, uh, <laughs> pulled it back to world. No, it's just great. It's, it's a World Science Festival held in New York. That's just, I'm just saying. It's a, Also it's, in Australia, so it is world in that way. Okay. All yeah, right. And yeah. co-founded uh, with your wife. That's correct. Very yeah. good. Uh, smart uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> very, very how, smart. How to keep that marriage yeah, going. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so, Brian, what... There was recent news of the earliest star ever formed in the universe. Yeah. So were you on top of that story? Uh, been following it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because what, what we know from as astrophysicists is you get the Big Bang, got that, okay? Uh, then you have the cosmic microwave background, got that. But nothing's formed yet. You got to make stuff that you can recognize in modern times, and there's this long period, hundreds of millions of years, where nothing is happening. And so we call that the cosmic dark ages. Yeah. Right, say right, dark ages. And so, let me hear dark. Dark Yeah, there ages. you go. How, 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 you give him a B plus? I'm gonna give him a B plus. Okay. I'll work on it, I'll work <laughs> on it. <laughs> so, so the dark ages, before the first stars had formed. So there was the hunt, the eternal hunt, can we find that first star? And a recent news announcement said what? Well, there's now evidence that those first stars may have formed about 180 million years after the Big Bang. And it's hard to find them because they're not actually sitting out there waiting for us to see them directly. You have to find an indirect test to see their presence by virtue of their impact on their environment. And in a very clever experiment, that's what was done. And how'd they do that experiment? 
Well, you mentioned the cosmic microwave background mm -hmm. radiation, right? I think, I mean, just people know what that is? This is here, yeah. No, I mean, even if, <laughs> listen, because, you know, there are some people, like, at home listening that may not know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm just saying, you know, for their sake, maybe you should tell them. Okay. <laughs> so this is, this is heat left over from the Big Bang. The Big Bang's very hot. As the universe expands, it cools down. But the heat doesn't disappear. It's still there. And indeed, we can see that heat coming to us through powerful satellite-borne telescopes today. Now, that is a fantastic discovery in its own right that won the Nobel Prize, the discovery of the microwave background radiation. But now imagine this. It's won the Nobel Prize twice. That's true. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The, the initial discovery and then and, a more and, and the final version. I, I got to tell you, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the same. The same thing, just mm -hmm. like five years later. Oh my God, that was so. We should give it to him again. <laughs> we should give it to him again. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. No, it was a badass thing we found in the universe. Yeah. Okay. And it was found by mistake. Mistake, yeah. Right? Oh, so you do know about this. Man, you said mistake before I did. Oh, I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so, how, so how did the, the cosmic background tell us this? Well, the, the theory was that when these initial stars formed, they would be very large, much larger than the sun, and very hot and they would have emitted a lot of ultraviolet radiation. And that radiation would have had an impact on the environment. A lot of hydrogen around it would have ionized the hydrogen. Why does that matter? When you cause the hydrogen to change in that way, it has an impact on the microwave background radiation that otherwise would have passed through it. Passed through it with no incident. With no incident. And now it's, got, it's, it's been perturbed. That's so. right. Now, actually, some of it gets absorbed, uh -huh. which means when we look out, there should be missing parts of the spectrum okay. that are being absorbed by this hydrogen, which itself is being affected so by not, these So stars. we're not seeing the stars themselves. We're seeing a, some kind of smoking gun of the stars. Yeah, we're seeing a shadow in some sense of the stars. Oh, and my it, God. It's just like the Russia investigation. <laughs> <laughs> So, Chuck, I didn't tell you, the reason why we, we have such Big Bang expertise mm -hmm. is because we have both independently appeared on the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, actually. Actually, I was only on once. Were you on once? Only or? on once, yeah. Oh, they didn't invite you back? No, they didn't. Yeah, they didn't invite me Not back. Not you either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I thought you did really well. I thought you did really no, well. I, 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 I'm so not an actor. And I, I depend on people allowing a little latitude for that cameo, non-actor delivered lines. Yeah. You know? You say, okay, they're not really an actor, but we'll, 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 we'll let it slide. You were good. Well, thank you. I and, appreciate and, that. And, and plus, Sheldon gave both of us a hard time. He did. Right. He told me that I should give up physics and consider reading to the elderly. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, don't read your own books to the elderly. <laughs> yeah, he, he was pissed off that I was uh, an accessory to the demotion of Pluto. Oh, Pluto, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he said Pluto was one of his favorites. And you told him to get over it. Yeah, to get over it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, that, it's, but he scripted to the, just get angry, so he just got angry. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't rely on a natural response. That, yeah. That's because that... he's not real. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Brian, this, so this early star, does it tell us something backwards towards the Big Bang that we should know about? Well... Because you're a Big Bang guy. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, the curious thing is that the signal is stronger than the theory predicted. So the signal's there in the sense that you've got this missing part of the spectrum. So you had people saying, what would a first star look like? Let's map it out. Yep. Now you compare it, and now we got something stronger than that. That's right. So that means you've got to go back and recalculate what? You've got to tweak the theory, and people are suggesting that dark matter may play see a how we did that? key role. Mm -hmm. You've got to tweak. Tweak. Yeah. Right. So I don't know what he's cooking up, what, what he... He just uh, tweaking stuff. But the, the tweak also kind of spilled over into the dark matter, so I'm not sure what this means. Okay. 
I don't know what either of you are talking about. <laughs> well, <that's fine>. so, <laughs> okay, so what of the Big Bang do you have to tweak in order to allow our our hypothesis to match the observation? Well, it may be that the dark matter interacts with ordinary matter in a way that differs from the conventional description. This is very speculative. We're right at the beginning at, of this kind of an experiment. At what point do you say, I need to tweak my theories, and at what point do you say, I need to throw out my theories? Well, that's the art. That's the art of science, you know? And, you know, some people criticize scientists for sticking to theories long after the data seems to suggest that they really need to move on. People say that even about string theory. They're wrong, uh, but, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, so it's, it's an art and it's a personal choice. I've, to his face, just to be clear, because I'll say this again publicly, but I did really say this to his face. Oh, snap. <laughs> when I asked Brian, I said, Brian, I remember y'all, for like from the, I'm that old, from the 1980s, I, string theory was being born, and I said, wow, this is great a new understanding of the universe, general relativity married with quantum physics, a marriage that Einstein died trying to find. How soon will you have this? He said, we're about five years out, about five years. And then 10 years later, uh, how, how far, do, well, we got another five years. And then 10 years after that, just another five years. I'm it, consistent. Hey, it's wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so then it's like the year 2018. Brian, how, how about... How, about five years, I'd say, something how, like that. How, you know? how close are you to this? And it, it's like, so then I said, I said, so, so Brian, why? He said, well, it's a hard problem. So then I said, or every one of you working on this problem is an idiot. He did. I said that to his face. Brian, I'm going to go with hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, at what point do you... No, I, I said that, you know... Rib yeah. jokingly, at what point do you say, we're simply not smart enough to even answer the question we ourselves posed? Yeah. Um, or do you just say it's hard? Because Einstein well, figured out general relativity basically by his lonesome in 10 years after he had special relativity. Yeah. And you got how many dozens of you guys? And yeah. for 35 years. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I got to tell you, the reason I accepted to be on the show tonight is... <laughs> <laughs> okay, what, what? I'm finally willing. No, here's, here's the situation. If we were not making progress, then I wouldn't need you to tell me to give it up, right? I don't believe in reincarnation. I think you live once, and I don't want to spend my life working on a theory if I really don't think it has the promise to reach the goal that we have set for ourselves. So, so you're so, honest so, with yourself. So, I'm totally honest. And, but we you have need so to... much in common because I don't believe in it because I don't want to be a turtle. <laughs> okay. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> now, you said I don't believe in reincarnation. For some reason, I think I'm coming back as oh, a turtle. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I got oh! it. Yeah, yeah, we we both missed that. Went like yeah, this, yeah, you know. Yeah, and you're the astrophysicist. We both missed that. <laughs> <laughs> See, they I, got it. Go no, ahead. But here's the thing. Before no, no, we, they did not get that. Oh, they got, did you not get that? <laughs> so no. where were we? But I know exactly where we were. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. I know exactly where we were. So what, what I'm asking you as yeah. a theoretical physicist, leading theoretical physicist, we have an observation, an astronomical observation, and it forces you to go back and re tweak. Are you tweaking Big Bang? You tweaking quantum physics? You're tweaking, what are you tweaking? Well, in this particular case, you really are tweaking something that we yet don't understand fully, which is dark matter. So that's ripe for being tweaked. But look, there so are dark other matter things. is like mysterious gravity of the universe. We have no idea what's causing it. But, but, I'll, but I'll give you another example, which has happened recently, right? There have been measurements of the rate of the expansion of space. And those measurements, very recently, are seeming to be incompatible with earlier measurements done in a different way. This regarding. had a whole other uh, recent result. A whole other recent result, result, exactly. And this one, if it's correct, this is one that could really change our understanding of the early universe dramatically, right? 
in order to get the measurements that are done on the expansion of space looking at the microwave background radiation and those that are coming from looking at supernova explosions, to get those compatible right now is going to require perhaps tweaking the dark energy. It may require tweaking our understanding of the gravitational force. I mean, there are many things that may come into that particular Tweak reconciliation. our understanding of the gravitational force itself? Yeah, I mean, whenever you talk about dark energy, right? Everyone knows what dark energy is? Yeah. No, well, I'm just saying, some people at home may not. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so this energy-filling space that we believe yields a repulsive gravity that's causing the universe to speed up in its acceleration. And when, when it theoretically should be slowing down. That's right, that's right, that's right. Ordinary gravity pulls things together. It should right. be slowing down. Okay. The shock that we got in 1998 is that it's not slowing down in the rate of expansion. It's speeding up. Against and, the wishes of gravity. And, well, here's the thing. We didn't understand gravity well enough. Gravity can not only be attractive, it can be repulsive. And that really wasn't taken into account in, until about 1998 when it comes to cosmology. Now... The possibility is maybe this outward push is itself getting stronger over time. And so that means thinking it was one thing would be an incomplete understanding of that phenomenon. Yes, and which that's would what actually is. change everything. But that's what which is, is why yes. you have to tweak string theory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so if it affects gravity, then every moment of our models from the Big Bang forward would have to be rethought, put back in the computer, say, now what are you going to give me with this new understanding? L literally, because these equations are so complex, there's so many features that come into play that you have to put it on a computer and simulate and see what happens. Okay, so now, does that affect any thinking of what's going on before the universe began? Well, I mean, people play with those sorts of ideas. But it's hard to know if that question even makes sense, right? It makes sense to say, what happened before you were born? What happened before the Earth formed? Those sorts of phenomenon certainly were preceded by something else in the universe. But the Big Bang may have been not just the beginning of the universe as we think of it as stuff. It could have been the beginning of time itself. This past Sunday, we aired our, my interview with Stephen Hawking. Went to the dude's office in Cambridge. And one of the, I asked him what was around before the Big Bang. He gave an answer, and nobody understood the answer. Yeah. So now, you check it out on, if you don't get So, so... I have no idea what he was saying. What was he saying? saying? I have no idea. <laughs> I haven't seen the podcast. You got to watch the show. Yeah, I will. Yeah, you, you, didn't, you didn't prep me on this one. All right. But, uh, <laughs> Let, no, no, no. Allow, but give me allow, some ideas, allow me to explain what he was saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, so, <laughs> well, so, so, no, but... You can give me two or three ideas that people yeah. have about what preceded the Big Bang. Absolutely. So, Whether or not they're your ideas. Yeah, you I just... mean, uh, one idea is that the Big Bang may not have been a unique event. There may have been many Big Bangs giving rise to many universes. We are one of those and we're, and we're just one of those, sort of like a, a cosmic bubble bath of universes. And we're just one bubble expanding in that larger landscape of reality. If that's the case then our Big Bang was not the beginning of everything. It was just an interesting event that we hold dear because it gave rise to us. But there would have been a time before it that wouldn't have been any more exotic than the time now. A time measured by some methods we have yet to divine because every method of measuring time exists within this universe. That, that's right. So um, the notion of a time going across all of the universe is a very difficult idea to make mathematical sense of. Like a meta time. A meta time of some sort. But, but people don't fully appreciate. But that wouldn't be time. It wouldn't be that time would as we be experience. Time. You're absolutely right. right. You're absolutely right. So in this universe, the fact that we can say that the universe has an age of whatever, 13.8 billion years, is only because our universe is highly symmetric. You look at one chunk of the universe over here and another chunk over here, and on average, their properties are the same. And so if that we, weren't the case, there would be no notion of time across even our universe. Because of this symmetry of appearance, you're saying, 
we can justifiably say we are all experiencing the same age of this universe. That's right. But if we looked over there and stuff was being born and over here stuff was dying out of proportion, yeah. we would be forced to say there's not one coherent time across the space-time continuum. Right. You see, because Einstein, as we're all familiar with, taught us that if you're moving, time ticks off at a different rate. If you're near a black hole, time ticks off at a different rate. So you should ask yourself, when people say the universe is 13 billion years old, according to which clock, right? If those clocks are moving, or if they're near a black hole or a strong gravitational field, they'll tick off time at different rates. And Man. the way we get out of that conundrum is what you're saying. The overall uniformity means that on those clocks, that are experiencing basically the same physical that. conditions, that. they're gonna <laughs> experience time the same I, I, I way. I love your clock, your clock pantomime. I beautiful. love it too. <laughs> Man, I have never in my life wished that I smoke weed more than I do right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, I... Now I know why they do it, man. <laughs> 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 so, we gotta, break, we gotta land this plane. So, uh, give it two, two, two final uh, questions. So, uh, if we're asking what was around before the Big Bang, you say maybe there was this bubble bath of yeah. Big Bangs, then that just pushes that question a little further, what was around before the bubble bath? Or it may push it infinitely far back. That's a possibility, turtles too. All the way down. So it could be turtles all the way See down. The turtle but the other, the other idea that does come out of string theory initially is that maybe our universe is a slice of space floating in a larger cosmos, right? Higher dimensions of string theory allow for that freedom. So our universe is like a slice of bread in a big cosmic loaf that may have other slices, which would be other universes. I bring that up because there's a theoretical hot. description. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna ignore these guys. Uh, so there's a, there's a, <laughs> We were good at that. Now we're like slices of bread. <laughs> okay. Now right no, slice Thank of bread. You. I right. got you. All right. With this is the bread loaf universe. Exactly. Go. And there's a way of describing the Big Bang where it's actually arising from the collision of these two universes. It's no longer called the Big Bang or the, it's called the Big Splat, right? So it's a little more evocative way of thinking about it. In which case, before the Big Bang, before the Big Splat, would just be these two giant sheets of space slamming into each other. And they create a, a yet a, a subsequent Big Bang. That's right. It's a cyclic universe. It happens over and over and over again through these collisions. So then what's before our Big Bang? It would just be an era of the universe similar to this potentially, but was just a different part of the cycle. So therefore, and my last question to you, the very distant future universe where we're accelerating as at whatever rate it is, does what you're saying now affect that very distant universe? It can, absolutely. Because if, for instance, we're talking about a cyclic universe... No, but my slice of bread is getting bigger. Your slice of bread is getting bigger, but that other slice may be coming toward you. So a trillion years from now, we may get hit again and be completely obliterated. How will we know if another slice of bread is coming towards us? That's the thing, we won't. <laughs> all, all I know is I am hungry right now. <laughs> well, Brian Green, thank you for totally... Fucking with our heads here. Tonight. <laughs> yeah, man, that's, Brian Green. that's awesome stuff, man. <laughs> Thank you. It's phenomenal. So hang on for a second. So we're going to uh, wrap up this part of the show before I hand the baton over to neuroscientist Heather Berlin, one of our Star Talk All Stars. And uh, while she comes out, but before that happens, we are going to have a special. Uh, musical interlude. Oh. Musical interlude. Oh, sweet. We are going to have a special performance by Baba Brinkman. Baba Brinkman, come on out! All right! <laughs> Baba, you're, you're a science rapper. I am a science rapper. Such things do exist. That's the thing. It's a thing now. You will, you will demonstrate that now. Let's all hope so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. They gave me one song to demonstrate that science rap exists. And all this physics stuff is going to mix with neuroscience. And pretty soon we're going to start talking about free will. 
And as a rap artist who's been at this for over a decade, you got to get into freestyle. So I'm about to do a freestyle interpreting a lot of what was discussed for this last half hour. And I want you to think about this. Either every word they said and every word I'm about to say was predetermined since our Big Bang on our slice, or there is some kind of free will possible. Ah. Thank you. Oh my God! Oh, oh! Right, right. So, Bob. Oh! <laughs> so you gotta run, cause you, where, you, where do you gotta be? Okay, so that was a piece from an off-Broadway production. I'm doing hip hop theater, very inspired by Hamilton. It's called The Rap Guide to Consciousness, and it's all neuroscience, cognitive and, psychology. And you're performing that tonight. You gotta leave here tonight to perform that. The show starts in 45 minutes. Well, get the hell out of here at, at the uh, Soho Playhouse. Soho Playhouse. Hope y'all can come see it. Dude, thanks for Yo. thanks for having me here. I appreciate Love you, it. Love you, man. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Neil. Baba Brinkman. So that, that guy is my favorite rapper now. <laughs> Jay Z, suck it! <laughs> I ain't never heard Jay Z say anything about his prefrontal cortex. <laughs> There's some good vocabulary running no, down that there. That was, oh man, that was serious, man. Just to be clear, he did that in rehearsal. Yeah. Five percent of it was the same. The rest was completely invented in that moment. Yeah. It was unbelievable. What's the dude talk about my mustache? I... So our next segment is going to be Star Talk All-Stars, where I take a back seat and we bring on the host, one of our many talented Star Talk All-Stars, neuroscientist Heather Berlin. Heather, come on out. Hey. So Heather is your show. OK. Go for it. All right, Neil, you can take a back seat, and uh, yeah, I'll... Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know me very well, Brian. You don't know me very well. Uh, so uh, welcome to Star Talk All Stars at BAM. I'm your host, Heather Berlin. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. I'm based here in New York at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. So Neil, Brian, thanks for being my guests tonight. And uh, we're going to... And Chuck, forget about oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're just ingrained in my mind. We've become one. We've become Chuck, my co-host, for bringing all of the wonderful scientific insights and comic relief. Thank, well, thank you for you. being here. So, so wonderful of you to study. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the intersection between neuroscience and physics. We'll talk a little bit about consciousness, time, and free will. So we're just going to keep it light, <laughs> light and easy. Free will. Uh, yeah. So not free um, willy, right? No. Free, free will. It's not that kind of show. Mm. Uh, we are going to. That was that a was, movie. That, that yeah. was, I took that reference I'm differently. Sorry. That was a movie. You know what was funny? I was thinking that. <laughs> and I was like, nah, I better not say it. I told you, we are one. You're like my subconscious that I just kind of try to keep at bay, but it keeps yeah. coming up. Yeah, that's, a, yeah. that's, a, that's a very good plan, actually. Yes. Um, so actually, Brian, you once, you once tweeted, you said, um, free will is the Wait, you're going to quote a tweet of mine? I am quoting In front a of tweet. this guy over yes. here? That's like saying I play baseball in front of Babe Ruth, right? <laughs> it's like saying I write music in front of Mozart, right? <laughs> All right, go ahead. Your tweets matter. Your tweets matter. Thank you. Free, free will. All tweets matter. All yeah. tweets. Not all tweets. <laughs> <laughs> not all tweets. <laughs> Blue tweets matter. <laughs> <laughs> I had got to do some it. red I'm tweets sorry. in the I'm house. Yeah, yeah, got some yeah. red tweets in yeah. the house. Okay, so so you said free will is the sensation of making a choice. The sensation is real, but the choice seems illusory. Laws of physics determine the future. So I had to say that you <laughs> you were compelled. It was determined from the Big Bang. What does physics have to say about free will? Well, it's not definite because we don't fully know the laws of physics, but 
the laws of physics that we currently have at our disposal have no opportunity for intercession by human will, right? I mean, we are a collection of particles governed by laws that you can write down and fit on a t-shirt, and those laws don't at any point in the evolution of the particles say, hey, can you like tell me now what to do, person? Mm -hmm. They just determine the future based upon what things were like in the past. But Brian, can't, can't there be an emergent property of that collection of molecules that we can call free will? Just mm. because, because the emergent property, if, we under, if you know emergence, mm -hmm. it's a feature of an ensemble that cannot be deduced by the study of the individual. Like ants. Like ants. You study one ant, mm. you say, hi, ant. You'll shake your hand. You have no idea that a thousand ants together are going to make an ant mound. Right. Or a thousand termites make a termite mound. Right. Or that birds mm -hmm. will flock. You have no way to predict that. So the idea that. is that, that one yeah. ant sounds like Woody Allen. <laughs> if, if free will doesn't Forget exist it. at the <laughs> level of, of physics, if, so the, in other words, if it doesn't exist at the level of physics, could it not exist at the level of biology it, it or, say, psychology? That's right. So, so it's a very good point, and it really depends on what your definition of free will is, right? Normally, the intuitive definition is things could have been different, and I could have made a choice for things to turn out differently. And if that's your definition of free will, does that resonate with your perspective of free will? Then I don't see any way to square that with the laws of physics because anything that you do is your particles executing some kind of motion and the motion of your particles in your brain, in your body, have no opportunity to allow you as a conscious being to direct them. What force could possibly that direction come from? Is it the electromagnetic force? Well, that one we understand from Maxwell. Is it the gravitational force? Mm, we understand that one from Einstein. Is it the nuclear forces? Those we understand from the standard model of particle physics. What force could you possibly exert on your particles that goes against or goes beyond those that emerge from the equations of physics? Could our That's free, the issue. Could our free will thrive in the probabilistic description of quantum physics? No. <laughs> Not as we currently understand it. And, and that's a natural Don't place. make me fight you here yeah, on stage. Well, we've done this before. Yeah, we did, actually. Yeah, I grabbed well, his lapel on yeah, stage but, once. But we both yeah. were wrestlers in high school. Different weight categories. Yeah, definitely. very different <laughs> weight categories. Uh, but um, yeah. but uh, so, so it's, it's, I should have said it, it's possible, but I consider it highly unlikely. So, so there is a puzzle right now in quantum physics that has been on the table for 50, 75 years, and we don't know the answer to this puzzle. And that's why I have to couch my remarks with a little bit of uncertainty. And that puzzle is this. Quantum theory says that you can only pre predict the probability of one outcome or another, right? 50% chance electron here, 50% chance there. Yet when we measure the electron, we always find it either here or there, right? One or the other. So how do you go from the fuzzy probabilistic haze of many possibilities to the single definite reality that we all experience in everyday life? We still don't know how to bridge that gap. So within that, if consciousness somehow plays a role in picking out one outcome from the probabilistic haze, then sure, then free will might come well, for the ride as well. There you go. But, so, but, but, you just but, said, you no, just no, no, said, no, 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 you, no. you just said, probabilistically, the particle can be here or there. Yes. But if you measure it, it is only in one place. Yes. So, my act of thought yeah. is I wanna go, I'm, I want a cheeseburger, that's the particle in this state. And I'm gonna say, I want a cheeseburger, bam! The particles there. Wait, let me, ah, wait, see, that's wait, the no, part no. I don't buy right there. You see, wait, because why are you poking wait, your okay. th <laughs> Because it's random. There's nothing that you did to pick one outcome because you wanted it, because you willed it, because it was your desire. And yet your intuition is you had the cheeseburger because you chose it. If it comes from a random process, it's like throwing the dice. And throwing the dice to get an outcome is not what we mean by free will. Okay, wait. You physicists. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to give you a neuroscientific perspective. Oh, good. Okay. So from, 
from a neuroscientific perspective, first of all, what's happening at the quantum level doesn't really scale up to whether a neuron fires or not, right? I mean, that indeterminacy. But from a, experiments that we've done, starting in the 80s, Benjamin Libet did studies where he said, to somebody, whenever you feel like it, just press this button. And he measured brain activation. And he found, and he said, even before they actually press the button, because that takes time to make the movement, just let me know where this little dot is on the clock when you feel the first inkling of the intention of wanting to move. And then what he found is about 350 milliseconds before a person even had that conscious intention, there was a gearing up of brain activation, right? So then, leap forward to current times, we do neuroimaging experiments where we can say to a person... Just so if people know, yeah. you measure people's brains for a living. That's my job. That's what I do, yes. Okay. I, just... I would be no help to you. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's my unconscious here again. He's always buttoning in and, you know, we need you. We need you. Um, but you can measure it using uh, fMRI, which looks at blood flow to different parts of the brain. Functional, Functional magnetic, magnetic, magnetic resonance, resonance imaging. imaging. Basically, looking at blood flow as a proxy to neurons fire. The blood is going to go where the neurons are firing because they need energy. So we can say to you, OK, just choose left or right, or that hamburger or, or not. And cheeseburger. Cheeseburger. Sorry, this is a cheeseburger. Uh, he chose to put <laughs> cheese on that burger. <laughs> We can say, we can predict up to 10 seconds before you even have the conscious inclination of your intention, which you're going to go, left or right, or cheese or no cheese, right? So at that level, I like to say, yeah, sure, we have free will, but we're just not conscious of it, right? The brain is making these decisions all the time, and we have this illusion of free will. But the question really is, is why do we have this illusion? Why did we evolve? this illusion? Is it important? If we didn't have it, would it change our behavior? Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that it gives us that sense of control that presumably out in the savannah, you know, 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, made the difference between surviving and not. If you're invested in how things turn out and feel that your decisions can affect how things turn out, you're more attentive, you're more engaged. It's something that matters to you more, and presumably something like that or some parallel story like that suggests why we have this illusion. So you're but, less likely to be eaten. Yes, that's the right. point, that's the right. point. Well, so, so you both agree with one another, with each other, that mm -hmm. from physics point of view, it's deterministic. You didn't use that word, but I'm putting it in your, in your mouth. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I mean. It's okay on the radio and live show, but I, I, I you know. Wait, so, and, and so yeah. Heather, so your, your results are consistent with his, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think from both a physics perspective and a neuroscience perspective, we come to the similar conclusion that it's an illusion, that free will is an illusion, even though we really feel like it's not. And actually, studies have been done, which when you tell people that free will is an illusion, and you start giving them subsequent tests, they're more likely to cheat on a math test. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to act in unethically. So the fact that we have this belief, those who have had it actually are better able to survive um, in the system along the line. We're so, more so likely to behave we're mo more if we likely think to we're behave. in control. However, we also have evolved for there to be cheaters, right? And they can win. And so if we we're, were all cheaters, no one would win. But if we all... I uh, just asked Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> and Chuck, he looked so deflated at the end of that game. Right? <laughs> he, was, he, he was sad. <laughs> um, so, so, you... so, so, Heather, is there a... Um, let me ask you a blunter question. Right. Does it even matter if that you know this if we all feel like we have free will? I want to believe that mm. I go to school and get a good job and behave, and I want to believe all that. Well, I, I Are you see... telling me I shouldn't believe it? That if I if one day I end up in prison, that was predetermined from the Big Bang? And wait, just <laughs> as... you're saying yes to that? <laughs> but wait, man. as as a, as as an addendum to that. <laughs> As an addendum, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. There's nothing I can do. To <laughs> so if I kick your ass right now, that's it. That was predetermined. Then it was meant to be from the Big Bang. It was meant to be, my friend. 
<laughs> I don't know how this got so sexy. <laughs> Plus, Brian, kicking one's ass is not a literal stick your ass in someone to kick. Well, I it, it's, say, but wait, you, that, from that, the hood, it means uh, just uh, winning a fight. Uh, oh. <laughs> 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 but that pretty Actually, Brian, Brian <laughs> was born and raised in New York City. So uh, went to Stuyvesant High School. So he's homegrown. Oh, nice. Homegrown. Uh, but wait, that predeterminism that you were just talking about. Okay, let's say, for instance, that you do accept that, and then that leads to fatalism. Mm -hmm. Was that also predetermined? <laughs> so the fact that you were given this information that, well, I'm not really in charge of my own decisions. My brain is making these decisions based upon these neurosynaptic transitions that happen within my mind. And so I just let that happen. And then I say, oh, okay, because of that, I don't give a damn about anything. And I just let it all go. Was that predetermined? Yep. Well, well, well do you? <laughs> but but also to put it in perspective. <laughs> Sorry, <man>. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to shoot myself tonight. <laughs> but the, but the, but well, see, I got to just let the record show. Good. Chuck put out a really awesome question right there, mm -hmm. and it just got a one-word answer. <laughs> you you could have at least stretched out your answer. Well, I'm, uh, yeah, well, Give I'm a guy a break. You no, know? I'm happy to. So, so, you know, often people, when they encounter these ideas, and you must have heard this too, mm -hmm. people say, okay, then I'm not going to do anything. Right. I'm going to sit on my couch, and what does it matter? Fatalism. Right? Mm -hmm. But you see, that's a mixing of two distinct views on one question. You see, if you think that you're making a free choice to sit on your couch, then you feel like, well, now I am going to give in to this and I'm just going to sit there. But if you do that, it was determined. So exactly what you're asking. If you choose to sit on your couch, it's not that you made a volitional choice. It was set in place. And if that's what was going to happen, that's what's going to happen. So but then by, by that particular uh, uh, measure... All information that we receive then predetermines everything that we do. That's really what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and moreover, but, you know, to just give this a little bit more color, I think, you know, your view, mm -hmm. Heather's view, and, and Baba's Don't view. Don't explain her view. Okay, I won't then. <laughs> uh, but, but what I heard Baba say. <laughs> Now, let me tell you something, Brian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me tell you something. Yeah. I predetermined to say that. <laughs> <laughs> we spoke about this thing before. Yeah. But, uh, but Baba's, Baba's mm. description, I think, really uh, at least helps me when I think in mm. those terms, which is it's not that free will is the intuitive one that we're talking about here. Free will really is the fact that we're able to carry out this amazing spectrum of behaviors. We can walk, we can talk, we can sing, we can come up with ideas. The fact that they had an earlier cause, maybe even back at the Big Bang, to me it doesn't take anything away from creativity. It doesn't take anything away from originality. It doesn't take anything away from having a sense of authorship over your own actions because you're the most immediate cause of those actions. They emerge through you, through your particles. Your particles and your brain are configured in such a way that when certain stimuli hit your body, you said and do certain things. Could the I, fact that it's determined, who cares? This, so there's different views of free will, okay? There's not, there's not just determinism and non-determinism. There are different, there's compatibilism. Which is which, what that is. Yeah, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. And compatibilism is saying that the world, it, it is deterministic, but we also have free will within that because of these probabilities. And the other question, getting kind of to what you were saying, is that, so then people throw their hands in the air, okay, if there's no such thing as free will, then I can do whatever I want. I can go murder someone, it doesn't matter, it was predetermined. <laughs> however, however, we have also- However, Chuck. Evolved. <laughs> however, yeah. however, that's, that's really it. important. We have evolved the capacity to have self-control as other animals. But in particular, we have the largest percentage of prefrontal cortex than any other species, which is the part of the brain that has that ability to control our innate impulses. So we hold people accountable for their actions to the degree to which they have the capacity to have self-control. Therefore, children are less responsible for their crimes than adults or people who have prefrontal lesions or severe psychiatric illness. So- Because children don't have a fully developed prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, cortex yet. Un until about okay. the age of 25. And so for guys, it's 35. Yeah, yeah. it's a little bit. Push it out a little bit more. Or uh -huh. perhaps 70. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, we got to wrap it.